Greetings and welcome to Mount Olympus. I am Hercules Invictus and today I am overjoyed to bring you Living Theurgy. And with me are the most awesome theurgists I've ever come across. And I will start uh, and go clockwise. We have Apollonius, we have Cleo, we have our wonderful Brandy, and we have Tony. Greetings fellow theurgists, how are you today? Well, thank you. Um, everyone has been busy and uh, we haven't really met uh, as we usually meet uh, um, in a couple of months. Uh, Tony and Cleo were with us here last uh, time and we had a really great uh, conversation and got to know each other better and uh, expanded our, our minds. Uh, so let's catch up with each other first and we'll go clockwise according to what I see on my screen with Apollonius. What is going on with you, sir? Apollonius, I can't hear you. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess what's been going on with me is really sort of uh, two two projects. One was uh, I was at Mystic South, with Cleo was there too, um, and uh, gave a workshop on um, how to do ancient Greek divination, discussing the uh, alphabet oracle and the Astragalus oracle. Um, and uh, it was well attended. And uh, so I, a uh, number of people came up afterwards and, and wanted me to sign their copy of the Oracles of Apollo book. And so I think that went very well. And um, so that was a great, great to be able to, um, you know, uh, talk to a lot of people uh, face to face again and attend their workshops as well and uh, do some, some good rituals. And uh, it was a good, it was a good time. So I, uh, uh, really look forward to that. It's kind of a southeast version of Pantheacon. Um, not as big, and it hasn't been going. I think this was the fifth one, maybe Cleo remembers, but um, so it's not been been going on as long. But it's uh, it promises to be a good a good festival, I think, or or a conference. Um, and beyond that, I've been working on books. Um, so um, as I, some of you know, um, I did the Pythagorean tarot back in the, I designed it really in the 1990s. It was published in 2001, uh, went out of print, uh, I think 10 years later. And um, so I've been planning for since then to do a second edition uh, just so the information is available. And um, I finally got that done. Um, it was uh, it was a lot of work <laughs> uh, because I expanded the book and put in a lot of, uh, of uh, additional illustrations of ancient art and um, alchemical art and things like that that are that are relevant to the Pythagorean tarot that I just talked about before. Now I can show it, uh, and it's all in color. So I don't know how well this will show up, but but this is the whoops. This is the um, 700 page uh, paperback, <laughs> uh, quite large format as you can see with, uh, as I said, lots of uh, color pictures in it. Um, so it's, it's expensive um, because of the color printing, uh, but there's a Kindle version I did as well and that's uh, inexpensive. I also did a two volume hardcover version of it. Um, there you can see it. So it's the same content, but because it was hardcover, I had to divide it into two volumes. So one volume is the majors and the other volume is minor arcana and divination practices. So that kept me busy, um, you know, going through that, editing it, uh, proofreading it, indexing it, and then arranging the, um, the actual uh, publication of it. Um, so it's out there. Um, and I, I think I mentioned this last time, but also quite recently, I did this both in hardbound and, and um, soft cover. It's the um, Greek and English of Plethon's uh, works, which you can we'll stabilize for a minute. You can kind of see that. Um, so, you know, the, the English translation was published as an appendix to uh, my um, Secret texts of Hellenic polytheism book, um, but this has the parallel Greek and English for 
the laws and his commentaries on the Chaldean oracles, his ethics, and um, a couple other short things. So I've done that. Um, that was all sort of before Mystic South, which was a week ago. Um, not quite done then or quite yet is I've taken a couple of, of things that I published on the web many years ago, uh, a summary of Pythagorean theology and uh, the Greek esoteric or the, the, the esoteric elements, uh, Greek esoteric elements. And I'm putting them together in, in a little book. And it's it mostly done. I'm again, I'm I'm putting in some cross references. I'm indexing it and I'm proofreading it and doing some updates here and there. And so that should be done pretty soon. Um, um, I guess I would I'm about a third of the way through the uh, proofing and, and indexing right now. Um, so I don't know, you know, hopefully by the time we meet next, that'll be done. So again, that's nothing, it's not new material. It's material that's been out on the website. I've updated it a little bit um, uh, to integrate it a little bit better, um, but um, it's it's not new material. It's, you know, it's out there, uh, but I think it'll be better to have it in, in, in book form. So um, that's kind of what's been keeping me busy uh, for the past month, I guess I would say. As always, I'm phenomenally impressed, and uh, um, I could find these by going on uh, Amazon. And just yeah, if you go on Amazon and search Opsopaeus, uh, they should turn up. Uh, you can also go to my website, opsopaeus.com, and there also there's a, a page for each of these books uh, there with an Amazon link. Is there is that the same one for the hardcover? Because I was going to ask you, is there a separate location for the hardcover version of the pythagorean tarot yes um, for purists uh, who just know that paperback is not good enough <laughs> <laughs> well I, I have to say the 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 hardbound is, is nice um no actually that may be different i think i i also have a link for it but the way amazon works uh they consider it a book series they don't really have a way of doing multi-volume books so it's technically considered a book series you know like if somebody wrote a bunch of novels or something like that in a in a series um so uh it does actually i think it has a different listing it won't just show it as an alternate format um okay but if you search enough. pythagorean tarot it should turn up and, and let me know if it doesn't ever if you have any trouble finding it because i'll try and and figure out how to make it work better any plans uh coming up coming up with a deck well that's it's it's a it's something to think about um uh but that's a whole other kind of project and um i'm just not sure at this point i mean there is a deck you know and, and it's illustrated yes. in the book but um I haven't really explored, you know, the the um, what it takes to get a basically a deck printed, you know, in small volumes. Although lots of people are doing it these days, you know, um, lots of people at PantheaCon and also a, a number of people at Mystic South have had their own decks printed. So it's something that's more feasible to do now than than it was maybe ten or twenty years ago. Uh, so I don't I don't think any of you have done a deck that way, but but I um, know some people who have that I'm, I'll try and get some advice about how that whole thing works. Uh, if I decide to do it, I'm just not entirely sure yet whether I'll even do it. But so you can you can all let me know whether you whether you think I ought to do it or not. I, I think that would be great. And uh, we were talking about collecting decks before we started. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know how to do it, but a lot of people are going on Kickstarter to help mm. uh, subsidize uh, projects like that. And I'm sure there are a lot of people uh, in our community who'd be very much interested in having a Pythagorean deck. Yeah, well, it's a good idea. Thanks for that advice. Before we move on to Cleo, does anyone have any questions uh, to ask Apollonius or anything to say to Apollonius? I was going to say, I, I was going to start with 
have you done any books lately, John? You're on the uh, you're on the like, book book a month club. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I say, it's all old material uh, that I'm just uh, revising and 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 really putting in book form. So, uh, and I also have the advantage of being retired, so I have mm -hmm. more available time than I than I might otherwise. But uh, but yeah, it's I, I don't write that fast for sure. <laughs> I'm not worthy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Apollonius. Uh, Cleo, anything new and exciting with you? What have you been up to? Well, um, as was mentioned earlier, I just was at Mystic South and had a terrific time. Um, I love going to Mystic South because, it, I, although I didn't present one this year, you can. it's one of the few conferences where you can do academic papers in addition to regular workshops and rituals and this year was a bonanza of ritual just all over the place in fact that was actually one of the complaints they had too much ritual when's the last time you heard that you had too many rituals um yeah saturday was the they they literally had two rituals back to back opposite each other actually at eight o'clock at night followed by another ritual at 9 30 at night um but yes i had the pleasure of presenting two workshops uh, the first workshop was numerology, which I love, and that was on a Friday, and that was great, and uh, met a bunch of new people uh, throughout the weekend just because of that, and also participated in a remove-in ritual, a Baltic sky ritual that was on Saturday morning, and finally had a wonderful um, discussion on cronehood and sagehood, um, that this was the third, this is the second or third time doing it. And I really appreciate those because you, one, you never know who shows up. And two, you always get something interesting from it that helps. And um, let's see. And in terms of other things that, that I'm doing, it's been mostly a conference, conference, conference. Some of them work related, some of them not. Um, Mystic South is always a pleasure to go to every year, in part because they managed to make hot Atlanta seem a little less hot with extraordinary air conditioning. <laughs> um, so highly encourage that. Uh, next up is going to be um, uh, Pagan Pride in September. Um, and that's what August is, is sort of not dead, but I have other stuff going on. And uh, this has been more of an experiment. I, to, I like to float ideas and things. So this one is in more between the divination aspect and the cronehood and sagehood aspect, one of those is going to be something, and I always like to use them for topics and potential um, proposals, that sort of thing. So that's that's what my time has been like. I'm still in the post-conference glow, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> it must have been great to, to be there and experience uh, and uh, participate in all those uh, activities, and you got to... Uh, see and interact with Apollonius. So that's awesome. Yes, he's so funny. And I and one thing I would like to say is the next time if you decide to do that, please have them give you a 90 minute slot. Um Apollonius, because that because I didn't realize that they changed it this year. So some slots were an hour were 90 minutes and some were an hour outside of ritual. And I think that there's so much information. It could have very easily gone to 90 minutes without any problem whatsoever. So and I, and I really enjoyed it. So thank you. And yes, and I want to say who's looking for the two hardcover books. So I'll, I'll ask you later how else to find it. So, but yes. Um, does anyone have anything to ask uh, Cleo before we move on to Brandy? I'll ask uh, Cleo. Uh, Cleo, you are a, you are like a daughter of Hecate. Yes. So uh, Hecate, something few people know, was called the mother of angels in antiquity. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe we have many of those tales, but she is the, the uh, mother of angels. And she was actually listed as the mother of one of the few that are named, but uh, there's not much information on them, Angelus, mm -hmm. so, which means angel. <laughs> so, um, so I would like to invite you to, when we, in our angelic uh, 
um, dialogue. So when we get to Hekate, I'd like to invite you to, to that because uh, uh, from what you've shared so far, you have a, a lot to contribute and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your insights and your uh, information. Okay, thank you. If I can interrupt, uh, I mean, she's also Daimone Arkes, a uh, leader of Daimons. Mm -hmm. The the, the daimon, daimonas means in between spirit, as you know. Yeah, yeah. They're always there, like even though with under Christianity, the administration changed. So you have like a <laughs> bunch of people in charge in heaven. And then you have Hades is still called Hades. And uh, uh, Haron, who's now called Haros, and Thanatos are still escorting people back and forth to the land of the dead. And uh, Hermes isn't around, but there's a big bird that has taken his place. People see the black <laughs> bird now. The uh, Hermes so, bird, you know. But the, the, but the demonists, which are now called Sotika or exotics, are still there. The Naraides are still there. The Kalikansar is still there. Uh, the Satires. You know, there's always sightings when I was growing up in stories of encounters with such uh, beings. So yes, I, I don't doubt that you'd be the uh, the mother of uh, the demonists as well. Thank you. Uh, Brandy. It's your turn. What is new and exciting in your world? I was busily muting my phone. You know, it's it's interesting. I'm, I'm often like a very early adopter. I'm a person who does things before other people. But in some ways, um, I am the sometimes the last person to do something. So I'm the last person that I know and among this group to actually leave my house and go physically to a conference. So I did that um, this summer and it was amazing. <laughs> As you all know, it's just wonderful to be back with people um, so I, I went to Babylon Rising, which is in Indiana, and I was there. I, I planned to do two, two workshops, and I, I, I kind of looked at it and went, um, the, the two workshops, neither of them was about my latest book, Chord Magic. And I went, you idiot. <laughs> you, you have people. You can show them how to do this. So what I did was I set up my, I, I, I sold books. I set up a table, and then I went to Walmart and got a big batch of yarn and put it at the end of the table. And then as people walked by, I went, want to learn how to make a chord? <laughs> So <laughs> that was so much fun. Um, and I, I posted it to Instagram. It's very made a very colorful display, I want to say. So I got to actually interact with people like pretty much the whole time, in addition to, to doing the workshops. And I discovered something interesting about chord magic. It's very easy to do, right? I mean, you can um you can teach somebody how to do something, uh, how to do a chord, how to twist it in a minute. And because it's it's just made of thread and you can make it really easily and you might be tempted to think of it as a casual magic, but no magic is ever casual. Every every person who made a chord had some sort of experience, like sometimes immediately. I mean, I I, I would say to them, you it's for whatever you want, you know, we'll, I'll help you make it. You don't have to tell me what it is. And five minutes later, I'm holding their hand you know, as they cry going, it's OK. You know, it's it's priestess craft, really. So it was it was great fun. It was just lovely. Um, to, to get to, to do hands-on magic. And then um, it was Babylon Rising. So Babylon Rising is a pan bulimic festival. Almost everything is, is centered around a group, but this was deliberately um, set up to include people of many different kinds of bulimic traditions. So as I walked around, people in the OTO would come up to me and go, it's so great to see you. I, I was in the OTO and then I left it. And so I'm not there anymore. And I was there for 20 years, like making presentations, going to Notocon. And they're like, we get to see you again. This is so great. And which which was also really lovely. And I would say, you, you know that I'm not in the O2 anymore, right? And I'm like, yeah, no, I don't care. It's wonderful to see you. And, and so this is kind of a, um, a, a story about how important it is to like not burn your bridges. <laughs> Like I left because I had to take care of my husband and I, I didn't leave because I you know, had problems and I break with the EEO, I'm so mad. You know, staying on good terms with people means that you can continue to have good relationships and, and friendship. And I, I really kind of hope to, to model that as, as a way to leave. It's, it, was, it was just lovely. Um, and it was also lovely to, to reconnect with the, the Lima. I mean, having, having my um, like one of my major magics be so structured by a specific organization, it's really hard to then go, okay, I'm never going to do that stuff again, right? Um, and so it's lovely to, to walk around and get to talk to people about the Lima, about what it means, um, and, and to be a Thelemite among Thelemites. So I, I just, uh, I, I really, I'm a very big fan of that, that festival. 
and it also it kind of brought something home to me too. I, I left the OTO and I because it's a fraternity and it's an initiatory fraternity. It has an egregore, it has an energy, and I I severed myself from that energy. I felt it was only fair to the the organization and to me. Um, it also is a church, Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica, in which I have been ordained, and I resigned as an active member of EGC. But there's no real way to get that energy off, and I don't really want to. I'm still a priestess an ordained priestess, and I work with those deities. So I found that the um, having sort of separated that out, the OTO energy was there, and it wasn't a problem, but the EGC energy was really there. I'm still a member of Ecclesia Gnostic Catholica in that sense. So I, I have um, a note to go talk to some of my friends about that. The priestesses in particular, I've always related to them, and we've always, you know, shared shared information. So it was, it was really interesting to gather their, their thoughts about that. Um, <clears throat> the two, I did two, two workshops, um, one of them was Tantra in the Gnostic Mass. And so I looked out at the crowd and said, how many of you are here because I said Tantra? <laughs> you know, a little hands go up and I go, I'm so sorry. I kind of made that before I, you know, I, I, I laid down the title before I did the sort of work on building out the outline. And it turns out there's not a lot of Tantra in it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But if you want to talk about Tantra, I'm really happy to do that. Um, people don't want to talk about Tantra. They want to talk about sex. <laughs> and they're always really disappointed to discover that that's not the same thing, you know. It's not not a not a new way to, you know. Um, so that was that was fun. And I, I it was a, a topic, what I was talking about was the Gnostic Mass. It's a topic that I've, you know, researched. I, I was a priestess in the Mass for 20 years, researched it for 40. So I really have this like deep bench of understanding. And But it was really hard to explain. So I, I was able to actually make an outline and say something sequentially, which was fantastic. That was something I've been working on for a long time. So I immediately came home and started writing it. You know, so I now, okay, I have an outline and I have an audience. I can write something about that. So I started working on that. The second, the second workshop I called Sex with Gods. So I, um, I, I, I had sort of five things that I was going to talk about in terms of like sex magic and, and having an erotic exchange with deities, right, or, or some sort of divine force. And, and so I would just, that one I made collaborative because I got a whole group of sex magicians here, you know, these are the subject matter experts on this stuff. So I'd say, okay, well, let's talk about this. Let's talk about Neo-Tantra. Who wants to help me talk about that? Let, let's talk about carrying deity. How many people have done drawing down the moon, right? So I, I kept working through it and, and sort of getting people's um, feedback, which is really fun. And one young man stuck his hand up and said, okay, so what do you think about UFOs? Do you think that maybe we could be relating to aliens? And because Hercules had prepared me for this moment, <laughs> I was able to say, yes, yes, I do. There are people who do that. And they, they relate to, to alien beings in the same way that we relate to deities and other traditions. I think that's perfectly valid. So I always love, um, I always sort of as a life thing, validate people's experience anyway. Whatever your experience or belief is, that's yours. But it was really fun to have some background in that. Um, so I said, well, you know, I, I could probably, you know, having uh, stick that in my list of books to write, to go do an update in the um, in the, the sex magic. It was like my first book. And maybe, you know, 40 years later, I should come back and revisit that. But I did, I, I took a bunch of books and I sold them all which was fun. I said, okay, I'm going to go again, maybe in a couple of years and like uh, ship books ahead next time. So I found my audience, you know, they're, they're my people. Um, and speaking of books, um, I do have a book that I am about to, to um, come out. By the time we talk again, I will have it to hold up. I cross my heart. <laughs> a, a book uh, I, I've called um, a magical book magical journey to India. It's about my trip to India with my husband, but also a lot of research. Did a bunch of, of research in it. But I think of it as a vanity project. So I should have that out. I have written a book. It's just, you know, my own book. Um, I should have that out soon. And <clears throat> I wanted to, I think I'm okay on time. Um, I, I allotted myself 10 minutes. I wanted to come back and touch on the one of the conversations that we had because it came up during this the conference too. I asked this group to talk about magical secrecy and magical odes. And I kind of wanted to do like an update on, on how it's going out there as I, I wrote these blog posts and we had this conversation and people know that I'm kind of taking this stance that I really don't think secrecy oaths are all that important these days. Um, it's, it's a very interesting set of, set of responses that I've gotten. One, one response was, you know, a friend said, I, I don't agree with you and I'm going to drop out of your life and that's okay. I don't have time in my life for drama and everyone has a right to have their own reactions, which is great. I was um, 
I was interested to find, as I, I started talking about um, things that happen to people in initiation, maybe we should talk to them ahead of time. <laughs> and the secrecy doesn't let us like prepare people for what they might they might experience and it doesn't let us get ahead of what might trigger them. I've had a lot of conversations with people about that and it's been very interesting. Um, some people will come and report to me what their traumatic experiences was, were, which is um, uh, maybe to be expected about something like that. And more people are just sitting down and, and saying, yeah, you know, I, I would really like a way to talk to my friend and say, I know that you're about to be naked in a, in a group of people and I know it's gonna trigger you. So let's talk about that. And I, I think that that's a great conversation to have. Um, and then I'm also really surprised, actually, at the number of people, um, uh, witches in particular, who really have a lot of sympathy for this idea. There's a there's a sense that the the secrecy is kind of weighing us down, and they they don't really see what the the point is. Um, Hercules had said something about a lot of people say, I'm not going to tell you what happened to me. You know, I took a secrecy oath, but there's this published material over here. You can point to it. And uh, so I stick to that. I like I, I point to the, the published material. I do not reveal people's names. And that's a that's a very I'm, I'm finding that uh, in the witchcraft community. That's a, a very sympathetic viewpoint. So that was um, a little surprising. I thought in particular the third degree gardenarians would would have an objection. And nope, nope, they're good. That's it. That seems really smart. So um, I'm very happy with that set of responses. And I, I kind of been thinking about my own vows, right? I, I, I had a reaction when I left the OTO. I said, oh my God, I think I've broken a vow. And I, I've kind of looked at it again and said, well, you know, <laughs> the vow was, I, I vow to give every drop of my blood and penny of my purse to the OTO. I said, well, I didn't break that vow by leaving. I broke that vow like this, the next day. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean it's, not, it's not enforceable, right? So maybe I shouldn't give myself such a hard time about it. I'm the person giving myself the hardest time about that. And I, I thought about the other vows that I've taken. I said, well, I vowed to support the Lima. I still do that. So I'm kind of reevaluating my, my you know, self-assessment as a vow breaker. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm okay. At least the world hasn't ended. But I'm really glad to have the conversation open. I think it's a really important moment to have that conversation. I think this, this era is about um, transparency and accountability. So I think that those things are those things are more important. There, then there are always those people who are like, well look, I, it's so cool. <laughs> people, are, people are not willing to give up the coolness about, you know, having an initiation that you can't talk to anybody about and it was a secret and it was yours, you know. So there's the coolness factor too. Um, that, so I should mention that as well. So that's me, what I have been doing and my current projects. Wow. Uh, I'm going to comment on the oaths uh, and uh, the uh, public domain, basically. That that does work very well. When I have people gather and I, I get it all, like Masons and Rosicrucians and a bunch of folks who yeah. think are interested in the types of things that I do, uh, but I let them know that I'm not asking them to betray any oaths so, you know, or, or divulge information they promised uh, not to, but uh, any topic is open and um, what do you call it? if it's in the public domain, then we'll talk about that information in the public domain, because it is everywhere in television, in the movies, in role playing games and comic books. There's all sorts of esoteric topics uh, being discussed uh, uh, quite openly that people get through initiatic uh, procedures. And there are very, very many people who are producing this uh, uh, pop cultural material who, who have been trained magicians. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that works fairly well with, with with the groups that I've been a part of or that I've started. That uh, you know, just point out where in the public domain you got it, and then you could you could talk about it because it happened on Buffy, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, Carl said Carl Carl Llewell, uh, Carl Weschke, uh, the publisher of Llewellyn um, owner once said that uh, he, all the secrets have been published. And, and certainly I have yet to talk about something in the in the Western magical tradition that's not published. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I don't know if this is your plan, Brandy, but I'm thinking that makes a great book topic. Mm. And also it brings up the issue of responsibility because the minute you started talking about it, I remember coming in and thinking, okay, everything is all very, very hush hush. And yet there has to be a way to prepare people to the extent that you can. And also there's an issue of responsibility because since you don't know what's going to trigger someone necessarily, I mean, that's all the preparatory time you have beforehand that, that the people training should know enough from past experience and, okay, if you have this condition, this, this might not work, this might work for you, but you might need to have a little bit of warning so that you're, you're not going to take it the wrong way. 
conversely, there are others who might say, well, that's all a part of the experience. So you must, and, and so when you're talking, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. I can see why someone might, might now say, well, yes, it's all been published, but isn't part of the original point to go through an esoteric experience without warning, because that's actually a part of what you're supposed to be doing? And I, I'm just curious when, when you've gone through that and talked to people and, and upped and found out how, what their responses were, if anyone said to you, hey, um, there is a responsibility on the part of those training to actually ensure that the bad or poor responses are less likely to happen. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I, I think um, when you're talking about a book, my immediate thought was anthology. I'm not taking that on by myself. <laughs> I, no, I think no. it's great. It would be great yeah. to have a lot of different voices talk about that. Um, and it's a it's a new idea. Speaking of, you know, being on the, the forefront, challenging the idea that we need secrecy at all. But um, to, to your point about the um, the surprise, the surprise element, you don't know it's coming. Um, I have a, an open um, uh, order, the sororal order of the Sisters of Seshat, Mm -hmm. um, and it's an it's an open order. We we have published um, um, published rituals, and it, it is it, like many orders like that. It's entirely possible for you to go through an initiation as an officer, and then have that experience again as a candidate. And it is our experience um, overall that that it doesn't matter whether you know what's happening or not, what, mm -hmm. whether you, what the actions are going to be. The the impact is still um, is still there because the for us, the, the meeting of initiation is not like, it's not about surprise, it's a mystery. Can you open the gate to mystery and, and take somebody through it? Um, and you can't anticipate what's gonna happen for you until you walk through it. I, I should also mention, I, I forgot this, that we founded another um, temple at Babylon Rising. There is a second temple. My, I, I run the Isis Nephthys Temple and the Freya Hela Temple of Sisters of Sashat is now in existence. So it's an actual order that's actually happening, which is really fun. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really good point. I have a friend, um, Georgia Van Ralty, who argues that initiation is all trauma. All all initiatory experiences are traumatic experiences, oh. and that's what the initiation is. So, I think um, to to conclude, there are many different ways of looking at it, <laughs> and and the fun part is talking about it. That's that's my that's my final answer. And one final question: Has anyone ever discussed with you or? Have you ever discussed with anyone else about the responsibility of those who are doing the initiation? Oh, God. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, because um, I was in the OTO, the, the OTO uh, in witchcraft, we have maybe three degrees. The OTO has, um, you know, a lot. <laughs> I took 11 initiations and some of them are very, very intense. They take an hour. There are things that can hurt you. There are things that can kill you. I uh, Masons have. <laughs> there's a there's a Freemasonic ritual where um, a, a person is is supposed to be shot, and one Masonic group like swapped out their their dud <laughs> gun for a real one and killed their initiate. So it's an important it's an important question to be sure. And so in the OTO, we we had training where people you know we'd say here is some here are ways to to do this safely. Um, and I, I think that's one of the conversations that people are having. You can you you should definitely. Uh, take the physical responsibility to make sure that um, that this is a safe thing. And one of the things I know is that um, so you don't necessarily know that if if you're in initiation and something is happening to you, somebody walks up to you and begins to scarify you, you don't know that they've had any training in that. <laughs> so there's a tra trauma around that too. But I think um, I think it's very very important to to take responsibility for what happens in in initiation. Um, I'll I'll talk about the sisters in uh, Isis Nephthys Temple. The 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 earth initiation uh, is a uh, coming up from the underworld. So we put a hoodwink over a person. I, I had done so many hoodwinkings and have had so many done that it did not occur to me that I might have an initiate come by who hadn't had that happen, but I did. There was a person for whom this was like their first initiation. And so the hoodwink came as a real surprise and a trigger. So I put it in all the material. Hey, you guys talk about hoodwinking with all of your initiates before you do it, right? Um, but it, it pointed out to me that you can't know. You you simply cannot know what the reactions are that a person is going to have, which is why I, I'm I'm leaning in the side of you know, okay, let's let's talk about this. So, somebody's going to scarify you in this ritual. Are you okay with that? <laughs> you know, is there a safe word to get out of this ritual? Let's talk about those, right? So I I think that's a great great conversation, Cleo, and um, maybe we can put together you know Hercules. We could put that as a as a conversation I'll, like I'll safety and ritual. I'll yeah. yeah. Um, Brandy, just listening to you and Cleo ram the point home that our society has changed extensively. 
20 mm. years ago, nobody talked about being triggered. So you'd go mm. into a ritual, you'd be hoodwinked. And, um, and if you were traumatized, you pointed out before how important it was to be traumatized so as to facilitate the, um, the initiation process to effectively take place, then that was something that you dealt with. Whereas now, it, it's like people have to be coddled. They have to have their hands held through the whole thing. Our society has changed in the last 20 years. And that really jumped out at me listening to you and Cleo talking. Yeah, um, as I do the witchcraft and theurgy shows, which I should mention, um, you can find that on Hercules website and on my playlist on my YouTube channel. As I go through that, I ask people, what's witchcraft? Um, and and I, I discover that uh, people our age will say 50 years ago, it was really different than it is today. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm actually going to I'm, I'm going to do a blog post that just lists all the, the responses. But it's very, very clear that our understanding of what's happening is, is shifting as more people get into the into the community. It's become very wide. And so we have different challenges, which I think is thrilling. Wow. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to say to or ask uh, Brandy? Well, maybe I will. <laughs> Just, you know, because it, it really brings up this interaction of two things. One is the evolution of these different traditions themselves, you know, how they evolve in time. But then there is, you know, our, our culture as a whole is also evolving, you know. And um, I was thinking when you were talking about, um, you know, um, warning people about possibly triggering uh, parts of an initiation, there's also the whole matter of gender polarity too, you know, which uh, I mean, was uh, central really, especially to Gardnerian witchcraft. And, um, you know, and, and now we have, a, have to have a much more nuanced uh, conversation about that. And I'd say we haven't figured it out yet, you know, so that's that's a, mm -hmm. an evolving process uh, as we speak. We so know culture progressing, hopefully, but certainly evolving. And and then the traditions also evolving in uh, interaction with that. And that's that's good. Right. We don't want to do things the way they were done 100 or 200 years ago because uh, um, they were not good in some ways. Actually, um, that. Um, Apolloni said just brings me an idea. There was a presentation at Mystic South. I wanted to go see it, couldn't see it. I don't know if you did. It was actually um, someone who um, is Gardnerian high priestess on that mm -hmm. very issue about the idea of polarity um, and, and what does it mean with gender? The other thought that comes to mind really quickly is about why secrecy was insisted upon in the first place for initiatory rights. And I wonder, given the current cultural and um, and political climate, at least within the United States, is that going to be a something that we yeah. may have to return to, or are currently returning to, I should say, sorry, currently returning to just for safety measures? I think one of the things that's really important is that as I challenge secrecy, we continue to say secrecy is not privacy. So I can talk about my experience or in general about experience, but I, I would be way out of, you know, no one should ever out anyone, right? So that's important. Sounds like a great topic. <laughs> it does, yeah. Hint, Hercules, great topic, right? Oh, a fantastic topic. And we definitely <laughs> look into it uh, deeper. I'm, I can't wait <laughs> for that episode. Brandy, thank you. It's always awesome. And last but not least, uh, Tony, what is new and exciting in your world? Well, last weekend was a little bit disappointing for me. Um, I was supposed to have presented at Witches Fest USA 2023 with Hercules. And for those who aren't familiar with Witches Fest, there are two components. There's an online component where they have workshops and there is also a physical component. So last year, the online component went off without a hitch, um, but the physical component where people gathered together in New York City was marred by the presence of very vocal and very aggressive Christians. What happened this year was that the online component was canceled at the last minute. There were all sorts of issues 
And the way I read the, um, the, the notice was that there were a lot of people who were very upset by the online component being cancelled um, beyond the control of the organisers and people have been complaining about it and it seems that there will no longer be an online component in the future um that's how i read it, it um, i'm just going to read what it says going forward we have decided that we will no longer be doing witches fest in the online purview so the way i understand that is that there will no longer be an online component the physical component did take place and my understanding is that the aggressive Christians didn't turn up and a wonderful time was had by all. Um, it was supposed to have um, been quite an amazing event. And I had hoped to go to it, but I've just got too many non-magical projects happening um, in, my, in my personal life to, and I wasn't able to go. So the next event that I have lined up is well same as um same as cleo it's um it's pagan pride day but obviously not in her state it's um here in california so it's going to be um los angeles orange county pagan pride day and that's going to be in early october here so i've been slotted in haven't worked out exactly what i'm going to talk about yet um, the other thing that I've been focusing on is doing book reviews and interviewing people. Um, last month, I, I interviewed Denny Sargent. That went quite well. Um, I'm trying to line up Jason Mankin, Australia Taylor. Um, looks like we're going to be doing that, I think, on the 15th of August. Um, it's going to be wonderful having both of them. Um, I'm also trying to line up Patrick Dunn. Um, who's part, part of our panel, but is very rarely ever on the panel itself, but he, he is in the book. So um, I've previously reviewed his book on the Orphic Kims. I'm currently in the process of, re of reviewing his book on Theogy, and I want to have a chat to him about both. I had hoped to do the interview with him this coming Sunday, but he's in transit. He's been in California and he's going back to Chicago and he's unavailable and he said that he'd get back to me and and he'd give me a time when he was available so um I've got other interviews lined up for later on in the year so that's actually been taking a fair bit of my time just you know meeting authors interviewing them reviewing their books and the like it's a good way to acquaint yourself with um their ideas and also to meet them, you know, these people I look up to. Um, I, I missed uh, presenting at uh, Witches Fest uh, 2023 as well. Uh, they canceled it last minute. Yeah. Uh, I, had, uh, I had done uh, Ishtar Fest, which I've done, I think, from the beginning and back way back in the day, uh, we used to go to the festival, uh, but uh, now I, I do it online. Uh, and then uh, with uh, Witches Fest, I was going to continue this thread that I started at Ishtar Fest, but it didn't happen. Uh, so they requested if we wanted to do the presentation separately, and then they would add them on a website. But uh, I, I, I figured I'd just do a couple of episodes about what I wanted to talk about. And uh, if they wanted a copy, I'll give them a copy. Um, what I did talk about at Ishtar Fest was the... Uh, survival of the Hercules of Tyre in uh, uh, theosophy, Blavatsky in theosophy initially, uh, but then especially in the theosophy of the um, UFO uh, people and the uh, celestial beings and so forth. Uh, theosophy, I think, is important because it provided with a universal language to the New Age or what we're calling the New Age and ergo to uh, very many spiritual, uh, alternate spiritual and occult groups. So um, I'm not going to be promoting a theosophy as a worldview, uh, but I will be using the language of theosophy to communicate and then creating like language trees to see what other people are calling these same uh, type of things. It's kind of like with the Gnosticism where there's archons and aeons and there's, you know, there's different universes of like almost sci-fi universes and uh, you have these uh, grand uh, Theogonies and theomachies, and you know you have all this type of stuff. 
Um, you could say the same about the Theosophical um, Hercules and the Tyrian Hercules. And uh, one of the things I really wanted to dwell on was that uh, the Hercules of Tyre and the Theosophical Hercules are incarnating gods. So they don't come down to start religions. They don't come down to save souls. They don't come down to um, you know, do anything like that. They come down to see what it's like to be human at any given point in time, because if they're guiding the destiny of humans, they need to understand you know, what that means. So I like that. <laughs> You know, I like that better than someone sacrificing themselves for me without asking me if I would want that because who you know who would want that I would, I would want that uh, and uh, so that aspect of it I wanted to discuss and uh, uh, biblically uh, you had the project Elijah and you had uh, the uh, priests of Baal uh, one of the possibilities for that Baal was the Hercules of Tyre or Melkart as he was called. And Herodotus talked a great deal about him, and obscure authors like Nonus wrote a bunch about him. And, uh, and I, I like what happens in Nonus, where Dionysus uh, uh, goes to Tyre, and he uh, calls Hercules by his many titles, and you become aware of the syncretism of the era. He's, he's Zeus in some places, he's Kronos in other places, he has other names in other places, uh, and uh, you know, basically brings them a gift, and then they sup uh, with, with uh, nectar and ambrosia. And Hercules answers some questions that Dionysus had about the fountain of Tyre and so forth. And so it's a friendly, you know, chummy interaction. Uh, and uh, uh, Hercules is the starry Hercules, uh, the star-clad or astrochiton in Greek. And uh, so he, he, I guess he dresses eccentrically and he has like a mantle of stars and he has sprinkles, it sounds like in his beard. So again, it's very different, it's very strange, but uh, it's captured my imagination for quite a while now. And when I was younger, I had some experiences with a, a, a blue tinted God and I couldn't figure out who it was for a while, but eventually it was, uh, that's who it was. So that's part of my story. And I would have liked to share it at uh, Witches Fest, but uh, I guess now I never will I'll share it someplace else. And uh, that sounds fascinating. Please do share it. I will, and I'll invite you. <laughs> we could talk about it together. And uh, Tony, um, what do you call it? Uh, any exciting projects coming up? Like any writing projects or? I'm just churning through. Um, I'm still trying to get the sequel finished to um, Great Egyptian Magic. I want to expand it out. Um, every time I come on this panel, I feel guilty because um, uh, we've got Apollonius cranking out books at a rate of one a month and Brandy's cranking two out a year. And I feel like I'm really lagging behind. So it's uh, uh, I'm using it as um, uh, as motivation to to try to keep up. It's um, but yeah, you know, that's what it's like when you have a a high achieving group or almost an overachieving group. Um, you've you've got to try to keep up. Well, you do a lot. You churn out all those reviews and interviews, and all your things are very well uh, researched. Turn them out. Yep. <laughs> interesting. And so I see you as uh, uh, yet another busy person who's immersed in the process of being and uh, expanding awareness of their. Uh, their spirituality. So I don't think anybody sees you as uh, underachieving. Um, just in terms of raw output of books, that's kind of kind of what I'm looking at. So, um, but th thank you very much for your kind words and your words of encouragement. I really appreciate them. But books are hard. I looked at your um, at, at your Patheos channel um, or blog as you were talking and you you've been really cranking them out and it's a wonderful work too to do reviews for writers and and draw a spotlight to them that's really helpful and so i i, I really encourage you to do that and i i haven't written a blog post in forever <laughs> but it's also fascinating getting to know the authors work, working out what makes them tick um it, it, it's it's been very much a, a voyage of discovery And Tony's going to have a second show soon uh, called uh, um, Theurgy and Thelema, which is going to focus on the theurgic aspects of uh, Thelema. And uh, he'll be doing this with uh, Sue. So I'm looking forward to that uh, when it happens. And I believe Brandon's 
first uh, guest or one of the first guests? Brandy's going to be first cab off the rank. So Brandy and Alex <laughs> kind of been dragging Maybe. our feet on that. But we actually um we're actually thinking about I think I've said this before, having a um a, a couples format where um we have Brandy and Alex on and um and Susan and I are going to be interviewing people and we wanted to have um magical couples on and ask them questions about about theurgy and about their relationships and how theurgy can be used to, to enhance relationships and taken from there I, I think it's going to be fascinating and the other I shouldn't really be saying this but the other thought that we've had in the back of our mind is we can distill some of the knowledge that we get from talking to these people and maybe um flesh it out and put it into a book i mean people are always interested in you know in enhancing relationships and the like and you know i think that there's a a lot to be um gleaned from from interviewing people like that so hercules you know um we'd also like to have you and athena on the show if she can be persuaded <laughs> Not likely to happen. Athena does her thing. She's very magical. She does magic all the time. Uh, but I think she prefers to, to stay in the background. She's the most magical, non-magical person I've come across. She she has those um those spiral things that the the labyrinths that that she creates. She she's a very magical being. Our, our our home is one big altar, or every or every surface is an altar of some type. She she tends hers and does things with hers more than I do. Mine tend to stay the same. I I dust them off, and you know I'm I'm pretty consistent in that way. But hers, it's a living thing. The statues move around, and you know, uh, it, it's really really cool. It keeps me on my toes. Um, well, does anybody have anything that Dr. Asked, uh, Tony or say to Tony? Well, well, first, I, um, Tony, I, I'd like to say that I've admired your work for a very, very long time, long before I came over here. So please don't think um, that you're not putting out a lot. I think it depends. Um, and I, and I'm always so shy about saying things and promoting when I get to these programs. So I totally forgot to. Oh yeah. I do reviews and I also do posting um, for the wild hunt. And I always forget that. I sort of put that aside. Hmm. So please don't make it. The fact that you're doing a whole big thing with a channel is one, not easy. And two, it's amazing. So it's giving you encouragement. Um, Thank you so much for that, Cleo. I really appreciate your kind words. And then, um, and were we supposed to be talking about our future? our future plans as well? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, so I should I should have mentioned this, of course I didn't. I'm getting better, getting better at this. Um, but yes, after a number of years um, of two projects, very early stages, one numerology and one for the um, idea of cronehood. And that's been taking shape for a while because even though it's now fashionable, it's kind of weird to have menopause as being in fashion, but it is. Um, and has been for the past year but for but the magical aspects of it i think people have been talking about it for a while and i thought it would be nice to put something out with that um now that it's become a hot topic which is very strange strange to say i just went to an open anthology um start of a new anthology called stained and it is all about menstruation they had their virtual launch party yesterday and i thought oh okay this is terrific um but it's something that doesn't get talked about enough in a positive way, I should say, enough. Very negative, but positive. So those are my two things that I'm looking at about a year to two out, but that's, I'm at least announcing it out so you guys know. And when you do reviews, if you send me a PM with the link, I'll gladly share it if you put anything online. I will. I, I review for, for a couple of different places. One of them is facing north for things dealing with, um, um, with esoteric and magical magical things so i put in but yes i'll send you a link absolutely i'm also happy to review it as well so long as it's magical and maybe get you on for an interview to um to chat about it i mean any sort of promotion has to be a good thing absolutely and apollonius is helping me launch uh 
um, an Oracle show. And oh. Initially, I had it uh, called Oracle Quest, which is what I used to call it last time I did an Oracle show years ago. But I think I'm changing to the Empyrean Oracle. So, and uh, uh, Apollonius has five or six different types of divination that he's written about and that he's familiar with. So um, I can see having uh, half the season just with Apollonius uh, discussing the different forms of uh, divination and uh, talking about the books in which he shared the information about them. Will there be a show on the um, Astragalus? Of course. Okay. Just checking. <laughs> putting in dibs first to hear about that and everything else that that's unusual well not unusual but not not discussed not as often so yes yay and cleo will be helping me uh launch a show on uh ekati and angels so everything has a project and uh we've run out of time unfortunately uh, but I'd like everybody to share the contact information, let people know where they can uh, tap into all the wonderful things that they're uh, doing. And uh, I'm glad we did this. I'm I'm so uh, awed by all of you, and I'm glad that we're friends and that we have the time to discuss uh, these uh, things together and to share it with uh, other people who might be interested. Apollonius, how can folks find you and purchase your books? Um, well, my my books are um, the uh, uh, Books published by Llewellyn, which is Oracles of Apollo and Secret Texts of Hellenic Polytheism, can be published pretty much anywhere that sells um, um, esoteric or pagan books, um, including, of course, uh, Amazon. Uh, the, the books that I've uh, published myself, basically, through what I call uh, Pythagorean Pentagram Press, um, they have to be purchased through Amazon at this time. Um, and, um, you know, they're all available in paperback, hardback, and Kindle uh, editions. Um, so the best way to find out about them and to get a hold of me is um, uh, my websites. One is opsopaus.com, and that's O P S O P A U S.com. Uh, or wisdomofhypatia.com uh, and wisdom of Hypatia is all one word. Um, and um, there's information there with some, you know, links to um, Amazon or some other booksellers as well. And you can get a hold of me through either of those websites. I'm also on Facebook, uh, John Opsopaeus uh, on Facebook. And your websites lead to older websites that contain the, the wisdom of the world. <laughs> yeah, something it's something like uh, thirty years worth of uh, writings now. Yeah, so you can see a all in the form of a sort of a nineteen nineties vintage website. Thank you so very much, Apollonius. Uh, Cleo, how can we find you and your works and uh, contact you? Got it. I just. Did my new business cards with, with everything updated just so I can find this. And I got to redo them because it's in white. You know how hard it is to read white against yellow? And got too small. <laughs> it's going to redo those. Um, they can find me. Well, you can find me on, on Facebook. Um, Cleo, Jana, personal message me. I will get that. Um, they can contact me at Cleo at CleoJana.com. Um, website, uh, www.CleoJana.com. Um, you can also, uh, there's a response button or some sort of email button on the wild hunt that also gets to me. And, um, and yeah, that's about it. Thank you so very much. Brandy. So you can find me as Brandy Williams author on brandywilliamsauthor.com. Um, Brandy Williams author and Instagram. I don't post to Facebook too much. I, I'm a Llewellyn writer and an Emanian press writer, and my press is Nemosyne Press, M-N-E, <laughs> Nemosyne Press. Um, and I think it's it. Um, and I, I just want to say, you are my people. <laughs> anybody anybody who can, like, talk about what an astragalus is, and, and everybody goes, uh-huh. <laughs> you are my people. <laughs> Honored. Thank you very much. And Tony? Easiest way to contact me is through Facebook, either my personal page or my author page. And I also have a blog, which I write for Pathios called Holistic Spirituality. 
Thank you very much to all of you. It was a pleasure and an honor speaking with you, and I look forward to our next uh, conversation. Uh, thanks also to our listeners. I'm going to try very hard to have this up uh, by the end of uh, today. So good night, everybody, uh, and uh, you're awesome. Good night. Good night. Good night.